In this episode of Ignition GT, the Hyundai i30 Fastback makes its global debut. I get behind the wheel of the revamped Kia Sorento. Yeah, I really do like the less is more interior design and layout. And we chat to the members of the Toyota Gazoo racing team that proudly flew the South African flag at this year's Dakar Rally. And then suddenly we got this uh, report about stage eight to say that this could be the toughest stage of the rally. As you've probably come to know by now, the Ignition team likes to freshen things up every so often. And with uh, January a thing of the past and 2019 now literally in full swing, we thought the time is ripe for some change to take place. So in keeping with international magazine show trends, we're going to be kicking off every episode with our weekly roundup of local and international news. And this week we start off with a real cracker from Hyundai. In the past, the i30 family consisted of a hatchback and a station wagon only, but now the Korean company has added a fastback derivative and my European counterpart was on hand to drive it. Welcome to Spain. Today we're going to drive the brand new Hyundai i30 fastback and in our case the performance version. So this is the most powerful Hyundai i30 fastback. What it delivers, where it's weak and most important how it drives. Let's find out now. With 1 meter 79, the Hyundai i30 Fastback N is exactly as wide as the standard i30N. The car should look very sporty and therefore we're going to find a very big, completely black grille at the front. And the car comes as standard with full LED headlights and LED daytime running lights. To give the car a bit more air regarding to the engine and the brake system, we do have a lot larger air intakes here at the side. And to give the car the extra sporty kick, we do find this red line here at the front spoiler. Our performance version here comes as standard with 19 inch alloys. The whole car now is four meters 45 long, which means it is 12 centimeters longer than the uh, hatchback version. And this with the same wheelbase and very important, the car is about three centimeters lower. And that really stretches the whole car and gives them an extra sporty look. Of course, we do find the fastback signature here at the rear and very important we have two exhaust pipes and these are real exhausts but the highlights from the rear for my size are these very nicely shaped shoulders because they really put the car very solidly on the ground and of course this spoiler here with this black line the two liter turbo petrol engine in that car really makes a great job and especially in combination with a very precise six-speed manual gearbox. That's really fun to drive and very important with that car is it offers you different drive modes and one is the so-called N mode but that then makes the car so stiff that you can hardly drive it on standard roads. The i30 Fastback N comes with a two-liter turbocharged petrol engine and that features with the standard N version 184 kilowatts or 250 horsepower. The performance version rear driving offers 202 kilowatts or 275 horsepower. And that is enough for the car to have a maximum speed of 250 kilometers per hour and the acceleration from zero to 100 you can do with a standard N version in 6.4 seconds. The performance version does only need 6.1. The i30 Fastback N is a true curve wonder. Thanks to the electronic differential lock on the front axle in our performance version of the Hyundai, it roars precisely and extremely fast through the curves. But also every intermediate sprint or the braking before the next turn makes the driver smile. Let's talk about materials and craftsmanship. In principle, I do think that I like the interior of the car. We do find loads of black, but we do have very nice red stitching here at the steering wheel and here at the gear knob. And very important, we do have red frames around these air outtakes here. On the other hand, we do find loads of plastic as well. So around the gear shifter, we do have plastic here at the dashboard, we do find plastic in the door panels, we do find plastic. But on the other hand, that really makes the difference when we talk about price. 
The standard version of the i30 fastback and starts at 31,100 euros here in Germany and the performance version only costs 33,600 euros and it comes very well equipped. And even our test car here, which got every extra on board except the sunroof, will cost a lot less than 40,000 euros. Home, Mahindra introduced an updated version of its top selling KUV 100 NXT, and the GT team members got to spend some time getting to know the, uh, well, what shall we call it? Is it a cross hatch compact SUV? It's not an immediately good looking car, you would say, but it is quite different and quite refreshing in its, in its segment. It's got quite a tall yet narrow body, and that's together with the high seating position, gives the driver a really good view of his or her surroundings. And I think that's key to the appeal of this car. What I love about the design is that it has a two-tone color coding design, much like um, the Renault Capture. Styling, of course, is subjective, so we'll leave it up to you guys on what you really think about it. So the KUV100 is available either with a 1.2 petrol or a 1.2 diesel power plant. We have the 1.2 petrol on test. I found the drive to be a bit whiny and loud for my liking. The car doesn't feel very sure-footed on the road. Um, thanks to a quite tall body and thin, narrow tires, you do feel like the car leans quite a bit and you'll probably be susceptible to stronger crosswinds or trucks passing you. But it does give you a compliant ride on bad roads. And I think in especially developing markets, that's something that's really gonna appeal to buyers. From a safety perspective, all KUV 100s come standard with dual front airbags and ABS, while K6 Plus and K8 models get EBD, automatic door locks and an alarm. Inside the interior, it's actually not that bad. It's got some piano black finishes and some soft touches around the cabin. In the top of the range K8 version, Mahindra says you're supposed to get a touch screen infotainment system. But bizarrely, our test unit was fitted with an old school and very fiddly to operate stereo. Overall, the interior actually is quite spacious. You get decent leg room at the, at the rear, which comes at the sacrifice of a decent boot. Unfortunately, the boot is quite small. You're gonna struggle to get your weekly shopping in, really. At 200,000 Rand, it is a bit, a bit of a tough sell when you're comparing it to um, competent rivals such as the Figo, Polo Viva, and the Swift. But if you shop a little further down the price range and you look at the entry-level model, then it starts competing with the likes of the Datsun Go. And while I wouldn't say that the KUV100 is a better car than the Go, it's certainly on par. And if you like something that looks a little bit different and a little bit quirky, this Mahindra might be for you. Now over the next couple of weeks you will notice more and more periodic changes, but don't worry we are going to ease you into them gradually. Now something that won't be changing is our in-depth reviews of the latest models to hit South African roads, and one of them is the Kia Sorento, and that's coming up after the break. The 2.2 litre diesel linked to that transmission, it all starts sounding very agricultural. And then later on we find out how the 2019 Dakar Rally was won. And then we decided to be uh, behind the Mini all the way until the uh, last part of the dunes, we take all the Mini. So a mate of mine called me the other day needing some car advice. His uh, transport needs had changed. <laughs> Funny how the arrival of twins can do that. In his own words, I want a big SUV, probably seven seats. Big SUV, no problem. But you know, strangely enough, with so many behemoths to choose from, so few of them actually offer a third row as standard. Even the original poster child of seven seaters, the Discovery, now only offers that third row as an option. Yet, in the more 
compact mid-size SUVs, it seems that the seven-seater option is all the rage. And of course, then you've got the Koreans. The third generation Kia Sorento launched here in SA back in 2015, and it's just had its midlife nip and tuck. But as we're about to find out, it's not all cosmetic. The Sorento is the first SUV from Kia that is fitted with their in-house developed eight-speed auto transmission. All models have a new eight-inch color touchscreen, which includes SatNav. There's also USB and AUX jacks. And of course, you can pair your mobile device via Apple CarPlay and Android Auto when that officially becomes available here in SA. The system is really easy to use. It is literally plug and play. All derivatives now come with a third row, allowing seating for seven passengers. And leather is standard across the entire range. Obviously headroom is pretty tight, but what I am impressed with, because the second row can slide forward, there's actually pretty good legroom for an adult. But on the cosmetic front, it's the usual subtle facelift tweaks. They've revised front end features, so the grille is more bedazzled and detailed. There's also a new headlamp layout with projection headlamps and revised LED daytime running lights on the higher spec model. The bumper too has been tweaked and incorporates the fog lamps. It is clean and purposeful. At the rear, the tail lights are sleeker and they've also redesigned the bumper. Now, according to Kia, there are also subtle revisions to the tailgate. <laughs> Good luck spotting those. All models ride on newly designed 18-inch alloys and come with a full-size spare. That's good. So as expected, nothing groundbreaking, just subtle improvements on a premium, uncluttered design. And even though all-wheel drive derivatives are available, the Sorento has no overland intentions. With a ride height of just 185 millimeters, it is a lot lower slung than its Bucky-based competitors, but I think it gives it better SUV proportions. But when it launched here in SA back in 2015, it was the interior quality that set it apart. And this too now has been upgraded. There is a new gear shift lever as well as a revised instrument cluster with improved graphics. But to be fair, it is all a little old school plain Jane. So I expect to see a massive improvement here when the all new Sorento is eventually launched. I do like the look and feel of the multifunctional steering wheel, which has height and reach adjustment, as well as the redesign of the air vents and the center console. The configuration of the second row of seats is very versatile, aiding rear access. It has a 40-20-40 split. They can slide forward and recline with one-touch release buttons to fold them flat on the seats, as well as from the boot. So obviously with the third row of seats in place, your luggage space is pretty tight at 142 litres, but it's really cool and easy to fold them fully flat, accessing 605 litres so you don't compromise on any luggage space. It's a novel idea, Toyota, but what I particularly enjoy and appreciate is this, a storage area for your tonneau cover. That's brilliant. Yeah, I really do like the less is more interior design and layout. And as we've come to expect with Kia, fit and finish and overall build quality is top class, premium. From a drive perspective, their trusty 2.2 litre R turbo diesel engine is retained. It's got 147 kilowatts and plenty of torque, 440 newton meters. But the big talking point, of course, is the inclusion of Kia's in-house developed eight-speed auto transmission. So obviously there is going to be improvement in overall fuel efficiency and the power delivery over the previous six speed auto box that was in the Sorento. But I must tell you, I am a little bit disappointed. On the open road, perfect. Super, super smooth, great changes. It really works well. But in the city, when we're driving it, it just tends to hang on to first gear too long. So what ends up happening is the 2.2 liter diesel linked to that transmission, it all starts sounding very agricultural. It's like 
why don't they just get the first to short shift into second, which is going to be more efficient and it's obviously going to sound a lot better, quieter and more refined. So there's something I need to adjust from a ratio perspective. Uh, the Sorento has four drive modes that you can select. There is comfort, there is eco, there is sport. And then the final mode really just adapts to your driving style on the fly and that's obviously smart mode and as we know with these modes it really just adjusts the throttle and uh, steering sensitivity but overall from a drive quality you really can't fault the sorento it drives beautifully So Kia have also trimmed their model lineup, ditching their entry-level LS as well as their top spec SX and SXL derivatives. So now there are four models for you to choose from. There's their mid-spec LX which comes in either 4x2 or with their Dynamax all-wheel drive system. Or there is the mid-high spec EX which is also available as a 4x2 or as an all-wheel drive. And pricing is spread from 570,000 Rand up to 640,000. So yes, I know, you're gonna say, wow, that is more expensive than the massively popular class leading from a sales perspective Toyota Fortuner. But can I tell you, the sheer joy and pleasure of driving an actual SUV with a monocoque body instead of a reworked bucky riding on a ladder frame is worth the difference in price alone. Kia's sister company Hyundai recently launched their own Sorento rival, the Santa Fe, and in the upcoming weeks we'll be bringing you our driving impressions of that newcomer as well. But after the break, we go behind the scenes with the homegrown team that conquered the 2019 Dakar Rally. And the second part is just dunes, dunes, dunes. This year, for the first time since the Dakar Rally moved to the South American continent in 2009, the participants and their support teams didn't have to cross any national borders. While Chile, Bolivia and Argentina have formed part of the route in the past, all 10,000 kilometers of the 2019 race was contested in Peru, and that wasn't the only change in store for competitors. For this 2019 edition, uh, being purely in Peru, we knew that the, the race was going to consist of at least 70% sand dunes. So we focused a lot of our testing and development around the dunes, more than we would do normally, because the Dakar is generally a combination of sand dunes, sandy tracks, off-piste, gravel roads. So this year we, we focused in particularly with BF Goodridge with a new tyre development which was more suited to the soft sand. So we think of Peru being full just sand dunes but there are a lot of riverbeds and a lot of big rocks and unfortunately uh, Janil found one of those. It looked like some uh, oil pipe or something is came off or is broken um, because there's a lot of engine oil, we lost, we lost oil pressure and um, obviously you have to stop if the engine has not got oil it, it won't run. Qatari Nasser Alataya and French co-driver Matthew Bamel took the lead on the third day of the 10-day race and comfortably maintained it throughout. But that is not to say that it was plain sailing all the way for the Toyota Gazoo racing team. Each day you get a description from the ASO what the following day's stages are going to be like. It's going to be, you know, extremely steep dunes, impossible to pass. And then suddenly we got this uh, report about stage eight to say that this could be the toughest stage of the rally. And uh, sure enough, we started stage eight and we saw Sebastian Loeb was opening the road with NASA second. And I think after 70 kilometers, he was parked up stuck. The next thing we saw, Stefan Peter Hansel had crashed and his co-driver was hurt, suspected back injury and was flown to hospital. There was a lot of very soft sand. Um, it was close to the sea in some places and the drivers can't read the terrain so easily. This is a tough stage in Dakar. Uh, very, very hard. We was opening all the way, you know, until the, in the middle of the, the stage. Three cars from the Mini uh, catch us as a normal because uh, we are uh, only alone in the dunes. 
and then we decide to be uh, behind the mini all the way until the uh, last part of the dunes, we take all the mini. We had some navigation issues uh, today uh, that we cannot uh, finish in the top three, but okay, uh, the Toyota is good, uh, the speed is good, and uh, yeah, today uh, was not, uh, the last 5% was not there, but maybe tomorrow. The first part was not so tough. Um, I had a puncture after 9K, so I just, my mistake, I came over a crest too fast and hit the rock. So, um, it took us like two minutes to change, and then the second part was just dunes, dunes, dunes. South African Dakar veteran Janil de Villiers and German co-pilot Dirk von Zitzwitz managed to claw their way back up the rankings. But not everyone was that lucky and on stage a disaster struck for one of the South African built Hiluxes. Yeah, what can I say? It's, it's not nice that you fall out uh, in a Dakar rally because you're all um, living for this. Yeah, it's one time in a year, this, this difficult rally. We all live for this kind of job, uh, the, the, the team, the mechanics, uh, the engineering, everybody, and yeah, when you fall out of the race with uh, like this, it's not nice. By the end of the ninth day, a win for the Gazoo Racing Team seemed almost guaranteed. But you know what? No one was about to take any chances. So with Alatea and Baumol charging for the finish line, De Villiers and Von Zitzewitz followed closely so they could provide their teammates with the necessary support should anything go wrong. Luckily, nothing did go wrong, and on the eighth attempt, Toyota finally clinched its very first Dakar victory. A testament not only to the determination of Glenn Hall and his team, but also to the reliability of the much-loved Hilux. This year we had a brilliant car, um, again with ongoing development from the team over the years. Um, but I believe the single, the, the one thing that made our car so good is the ability, the, the Hilux's ability in the sand and the dunes. And the way the V8 engine, uh, you know, that we have in the Hilux from Toyota operates, it's, it's just a pleasure to drive in there. And I think that was a big part of the success. A Toyota Hilux uh, is a very special car, you know, because uh, not only in South Africa, you know, even in Qatar, you know, the people uh, really uh, love this uh, vehicle. Uh, and we are so happy, you know, to do this race, you know, and to win. Throughout its 40-year history, the Dakar Rally has been characterized by changes, and it looks like there might be some radical ones on the way in 2020. Well, the biggest change uh, for me in 2020 would be if the Dakar would come to Southern Africa. You know, that would be, uh, that would be great for us as, a, as a, a team competing from South Africa, a great opportunity for some great teams we have here competing in the you know, the off-road championship. And the countries we could go to, of course, would be South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, Angola, all have terrain suitable for the Dakar. So I think it would be a great opportunity for the Southern African continent if, uh, if Dakar would come here. Now, if Janil can win a Southern African Dakar Rally in a locally built Hilux, how awesome would that hat trick be? Anyway, next week we're going to compare two German and two British built premium SUVs in a bid to find out where you should spend your hard earned millions. And the GT team gets better acquainted with the Peugeot 3008. But until next time, you guys know what to do. No texting and driving. Buckle up. We'll see you next week. Uh...